Now, uh, I would like to invite for the next presentation um, on stage Mr. Vinkatish PV, Principal Consultant and Business Head at RAB HR and co-founder of Empower HR, a boutique consulting firm with operations in Canada, Oman, and India. Mr. Venkatesh is a senior HR professional with 28 years of international experience. His last corporate assignment was as the Chief HR Officer for MB Petroleum Services Worldwide. His presentation is titled, Building a Learning Organization. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Venkatesh up on stage. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have come here to start the HR part of the Finance Summit. And I was just uh, sharing with Atulia that I'm so happy that uh, the, the finance side, uh, a lot of presentation had a lot of people content. Uh, so a lot is happening in terms of the finance and HR kind of working together in terms of making things happen, so that's a great sign. So today uh, I'm going to speak on uh, uh, investing in people uh, is your future at work. Uh, so uh, some interesting studies, uh, some interesting statistics, some interesting thoughts. Uh, so, uh, so future of work is going to be very different to what is happening with you, me and today, uh, with you and me today. So uh, self-driving cars are no longer fiction. Siri, Alexa will recognize your voice and act on instructions even on a phone and probably will be more close and intimate to you than your own spouse. Connected intelligent devices are changing the entire paradigm of how work is getting done. In three years from now, not 30 years, artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, biotechnology, chatbots, virtual reality, augmented reality, and smart objects will be deeply embedded in our lives without us even realizing it. Just like how computers, mobiles, electricity, and to a great extent, internet and Wi-Fi are given things for us today. Robo-Sophia has a Saudi Arabian citizenship. You may ask, is it so? I doubt this will really happen. Our, our region is slow to adapt. Changes won't happen here. We are a traditionally family-owned company and is averse to change. You, you may further add, I work for an established company, good at my job, received a decent increment, even a bonus in these difficult times, and therefore feel safe. In the meantime, McKinsey, published a report that 45% of all current jobs will be automated using currently available technology. Even if you are conservative for a region and say it will be 25%, it will be one-fourth of all our current jobs in the near future. World Economic Forum in their publication says 33% of jobs which will be there in 2020-2021 does not even exist yet and will require a new skill set which is yet to be learned. Are we not seeing different parts of the world in which cashierless automated supermarket cash counters with cashier machines? Are we not seeing self-checks in counters in airports and even machine-managed immigration process? Are we not seeing we don't visit banks as often as we did those days? And most of the transactions today happens with the machine interfering, inter interfacing with us. In our own Oman, recent decision of the Royal Oman Police to move to e-visas has cut down so much of people and processes involved in the application process. And the visa comes in just five minutes. Our automotive Mulkia renewal process is also fully automated and, doesn't, and we don't need to visit the ROP for getting it done and things like that. So, so in 2012, just to give you a perspective, uh, uh, to say that, you know, it is happening. You know, we can't say that it won't come beyond seas and we are here and we are protected. No. I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of perspective. In 2012, there were 150,000 people working in the Wall Street. Three years later, using artificial intelligence, this number has been brought down to 100,000. A straight 
30% reduction in the number of people. A Japanese life insurance company, Fukoku Mutual Life, uh, Srinivasan spoke about a lot of technology happening uh, in the insurance space. Uh, so Fukoku Mutual Life has replaced most of their insurance claim processes with artificial intelligence. Even underwriting decisions are now taken using AI technology. Journalists, marketeers, tax consultants, lawyers, knowledge workers, and even you and me will be impacted by automation and technology very soon. Did you know YouTube with 1.65 billion value had only 65 employees? Instagram with 1 billion value had only 15 employees. And WhatsApp with 19 billion value has only 55 employees. This is, this is true facts. And see how with those 55 employees, they are able to impact the entire world using technology as a, as a leverage. So there are some 10 million developers, some as young as 12 years, who are currently working on new products and services using very inexpensive tools and platforms available to them and build utilities and services which impact every aspect of life. I stopped using an accountant for our organization's regular day-to-day -day work and use an app called as invoice to go which efficiently manages all my accounts payable and accounts receivable functions. It's an app which works in Android and uh, 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 you know, the other system. I pay something like $500 in a year for the service and what I need is to have a decent smartphone and a connectivity, that's it. I see no reason why large companies and corporations will not embrace these technologies. Increasingly, companies are moving away from one large expensive system managing everything with nimble, inexpensive, best-in-class solutions which will integrate and exchange data and seamlessly work together using smart APIs and other connecting technologies. And this is the future. There are tens and thousands of startups in every part of the world and has inexpensive marketing reach to every corner of the world thanks to connectivity and social media and therefore will rapidly grow its marketing presence across the globe. I personally subscribe and pay for several apps which are owned by companies in Romania, India, New Zealand, Norway and Vietnam. Technology is breaking trade restrictions with geography as a base. World has therefore become a common marketplace. I know of companies in Oman who are currently managing all their communication, design and artwork related jobs through a company in Vietnam. Thanks to connectivity, you no more need an agent in Oman to subscribe and use a product offered by a company from another geography. This will definitely be a disruption which will make lots of companies irrelevant soon. So, coming to the crux of the discussion, what do we do as individuals and as organizations to prepare ourselves to combat this mad, mad VUCA world and the technology onslaught? It's happening. We can't be mute, silent spectators. The future trend in workplace is going to be smaller workforce and an exponentially growth and an exponential growth through technology. Job roles are fast disappearing and being replaced by skill sets. So we are not looking for managers, we are not looking at assistant managers, we are looking at somebody with a particular skill who will come and deliver certain things for us. And that is where we are moving towards. Employers will require you to know new and emerging fundamental skills in order to use technology at workplace. You could be an HR professional, you could be a finance professional, you could be a purchase professional, but in addition to your domain knowledge, how well do you adapt and integrate into technology is going to be a very key factor in terms of your adaptability with the new uh, growth uh, scenario which we see in the world. So you and me need to do something before we become irrelevant. So what do we do? It's a question which I've asked myself and I think all of us are asking ourselves. First and foremost, 
having a growth mindset and move to a state of mind that we are capable of learning anything is most important. Using my own personal example, 28 years ago, at workplace, I started my career when there were manual typewriters, telegrams, postcards, inland letters, airmail, and trunk call. Some of the younger generations would not even know these terminologies today. When the IT explosion happened in the late 80s, I had not even touched a computer till then. Moving a mouse was much more tougher than catching a tiger. I felt so uncomfortable, not able to understand what was happening around. I took a very bold decision to apply for six month unpaid leave, enrolled myself into an intensive technology program, which allowed me to come to terms with ID fundamentals which were relevant those days. Therefore, the firm belief that you will be able to learn and sufficiently be skilled in any technology is a fundamental precinct of a growth mindset. We all need to talk with confidence, code, API, data, connectivity, and cloud computing. As organizations, there is a big need to give opportunities to your employees to learn and unlearn. It's a big lie and myth. I, 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 I once again restate it. It's a big lie and myth that learning, training, and education is expensive. It's no more the cost, but your willingness to learn, which is the biggest stumbling block to learning. Technology has made high quality learning pretty inexpensive. We can have Harvard professors teach us in our drawing rooms, thanks to technology. How many of you in this room went through the complimentary e-learning course which was offered to you as part of this conference registration? Put your hands up. Those of you who did would realize that you could complete a full learning course, complete assessments, and get certified sitting at home or even while you are on vacation. So organizations should therefore adapt and start using powerful technology platforms for imparting learning, training, and education to employees. Intelligent learning systems today can completely manage the learning path of an employee and also coach and mentor him or her using, uh, virtually using artificial intelligence. All this at an extremely affordable dollar value. So what do we do? First and foremost, as individuals, we are also equally responsible for enriching our own learning. How many HR professionals in this room would understand chatbots? Chatbots is a very disruptive technology which is coming in the HR services field. A lot of HR services currently which is being offered will be very easily taken over by chatbots. It's not expensive and it's coming. How many finance professionals in this room would understand blockchain? These are technologies which are going to disrupt these professions in the next few years. I'm specifically speaking about HR and finance. You cannot wait for your employer to give you an opportunity to learn and educate yourself about these technologies and how they will be used in the finance and the HR world. There are so many learning opportunities available to you free of cost. How many of us have used Linda? Linda Learning, which comes free with LinkedIn to upskill ourselves. There is, Linda offers thousands and thousands of relevant free courses to enhance our knowledge. Linda is intelligent to recognize your learning needs based on your profession, the kind of search, searches you do and your interaction and therefore suggests relevant content for you to educate yourself. And it's happening today. There are thousands of micro learning and videos in the public domain like YouTube which can educate you in anything under the sun absolutely free of cost. So, the buck stops at you. So, three takeaways to all of you as individuals. Be curious. Have a childlike enthusiasm to learn anything which is of interest to you. Don't shy away from asking people, even if they are younger to you if you don't know about something. Number two, 
I've spoken about it earlier. Very, very important. Have a growth mindset. Let not your fears and inhibitions stop you from learning what is relevant to you. Be an aggressive learner. Learning need not come only by attending courses and attending training programs. Very important. Learning need not come by attending courses and training programs. Learning is all around you. It is up to you to embrace it. Have a learning plan and all possible resources to accomplish it. The third point, don't be intimidated by technology. I think there's a spelling mistake there. Face it, largely it is the fear of the unknown. Don't get intimidated. The more you push yourself towards it, the more these things will become easier and less complicated. We as individuals need to take responsibility for what we need to learn to be relevant in the workplace. Lastly, three takeaways to organizations. Adopt technology-oriented learning. It's coming and we all have to embrace it. I bet it is not expensive. Technology-based learning is not only for IT and the finance industry. It is relevant to all industries. In fact, the largest user of technology-based learning is the retail industry. Encourage employees to learn. Even incentivize them to learn a new skill which will, be, which will be relevant to you as an organization. Third, have a structured learning program so that there is some method in the madness. Have a learning plan in place for every level of employees in your organization and connect it to growth, compensation, and succession. We as organizations need to take responsibility for fostering and uh, fostering an innovation-driven learning culture and provide employees with opportunities to learn and develop relevant skills. I want to finish my speech with a very, very short video, uh, a one-minute video which, was, which I saw in the internet, which was done by EY, which I thought will be very, very relevant to you. We will see the video. We're in the fourth industrial revolution, where change is bigger and faster than ever. Macroeconomic trends and technology advances, including smart devices and AI, are altering industries, businesses, professions and jobs at an unprecedented scale and rate. And the disruption for professionals is real. Five million jobs may cease to exist. The traditional employer-employee relationship is already shifting. We're moving into the human cloud, where four in ten of us will be on contract, not in permanent jobs, by 2020. Successful future professionals will be those who continuously learn and adapt, both their skills and themselves. Based on global research and insights, we've identified the future skills that matter. Complex problem solving, creativity, emotional intelligence, cognitive flexibility, Collaboration. With these, you'll always be in demand. And you'll need to adapt yourself to the new world of work. Have self-reliance, resilience, self-promote, and constantly develop yourself. But crucially, don't do it all on your own, because networks will be even more critical. So if you can continuously adapt, the developments around you will no longer be a threat. Instead, Change becomes an opportunity. So ladies and gentlemen, building a learning organization is your first step in making your organization future ready. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Venkatesh, for your insights. I would now like to invite on stage Dr. Uh, Amar al Associate Director for the Takatov Scholars Program, a role focused on contributing to the development and implementation of the program and managing stakeholders. During his career, uh, he has worked on designing curricula, conducting quality assurance reviews, developing management and academic systems, and externally reviewing higher education institutes in Oman. Um, Dr. Amar's advocacy in education spans previous roles as a lecturer and subsequent head of engineering at the Higher College of Technology, as well as assistant technology, uh, as well as assistant dean, sorry, and dean at the Salala College of Technology. The topic of his presentation is the role of the Takat of Scholars program in promoting Omani talent. Assalamu alaikum, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thanks Vinkatesh for uh, setting the stage uh, for us. 
Um, not by design, um, but by coincidence, it's going to be the flip of your presentation. I'll start with the video. But before we go into the video, um, the topic of my talk is about leadership. Jack Welch once said, before you are a leader, success is all about growing yourself. When you are a leader, success is all about growing others. Let's see some future leaders in the making. Nature has always amazed me with well-designed machines, calculated actions, and sophisticated scaffolds. The thought of engineering live organs, artificial gills, or bacteria that can capture energy excites me, as design these things would, quite frankly, change the perspective of our reality. My name is Nuaya Hinaay. Sultan Hamad Al Baydani, Zal Walid Al Harbi, Kathar Al Sidari, Muhammad Al Ghaythi, Marcel Al Blouchi, Ali Al Hajri, Hamad Al Magbadi, Zawan Al Ujayli, Benoit Siabi, Tanita Al Abd Al Salam, and I'm from Muscat. Walid Saham, Matrah, Sahar, Muscat, Sahar Al Batina North, Al Sawaq Al Batina North, Sahar Al Batina North, Matrah, Muscat, Salal Al Dufar. That's it. We currently attend. Pearson College, UWC, NBC Canada, UWC Isaac, Japan, the United World College of Atlantic in Great Britain, St. Michael University School, Canada, the University of Nottingham, University of Toronto in Canada, Edinburgh University in Scotland, San Francis Xavier University in Nova Scotia, Canada, Imperial College London, the United Kingdom. My favorite activity this year? is volunteering for the community. Creating an Arabic club. Arabic conversation club where we teach interested students to learn Arabic. I really felt like I needed to share my language and also the culture. Starting two new languages. Going and tour to Australia with the school rugby team. Writing and the new yoga classes. Creating logos or example logos for companies. Meeting refugees, listening to their stories and trying to teach them English. The achievement I'm most proud of in this past year has been traveling to Arizona. I thought at an elementary school there and it was just amazing to see how children from a different culture consume information. Being one of the school leaders. Getting over some strong universities. Being able to cope with Atlantic College community and making the most of the opportunity. What I value most about my education is being able to feel my value and my worth as a learner. It's all about me. This is my education. I am responsible for my own education. The fact that we get to learn in many different ways. Being in a setting that allows me to challenge myself and challenge the views of people around me. Gaining a global perspective of innovation and entrepreneurship. Dedication to be able to really absorb all I can potentially offer. At the end, it would be a gateway to an amazing work opportunity in the future. I'm looking forward to go back to Oman and share my experience with my surroundings and benefit my community as much as possible bringing all the new ideas and things that I learned here and implement them in Oman and share those. Contribute to my community, build our country and take us to the right direction, which we're already on. What you just saw is work in progress, by the way. Some of them are at their boarding schools, others at our universities. Um, the first batch, I think, we start, we start graduating June this year, and then next year and onwards. For those of you that like football, American football in particular, the late Vince Lombardi is quoted as saying, leaders are not born, they are made. And they are made just like anything else, through hard work. And that's the price we'll have to pay to achieve that goal, or any goal for that matter. That's what Oman Oil set out to do in 2012, when it started the Ticket of Scholars program. The aim was national, to develop future leaders for Oman in an, innovate, in, in an innovative way that yields the results. Since then, six more sponsors have joined the journey. Orpec, Oman Trading International, Salat Al-Methanol Company, Occidental of Oman, Mitsui, and Ishraqa Kim Jiramdas. With their support, the program was able to achieve a lot throughout the past six years or so. We tested over 3,100 applicants to the program, graduated 342 students from the enrichment program, sent over 100 students to scholarships all over the world, to leading boarding schools and universities, all of whom had to, have had to gain admission into their universities and institutions. All of them did. What we do is starting the development of these young, talented Omanis earlier than usual. We receive students who have just completed grade 10, 
and enroll them into an enrich en enrichment program that focuses on the 21st century competencies, or what is commonly referred to as employability skills. These include all oral and written communication in teams and as individuals. Recognizing the importance of communication for their future success, we expose them to the structure and art of written communication and oral communication to different audiences. All of this is done within the framework of critical thinking, problem solving, research, and inquiry. As Vinkitesh made it clear, with the onslaught of artificial intelligence and automation of jobs, what's going to be required is jobs that require creativity from the person. Not only are these skills critical for any successful employee, they play and will play a significant role in the development of the organizations they serve. These skills will be much more demanded because of, again, artificial intelligence and enhanced automation. Which brings us to the next skill, ICT. The need to use technology effectively and creatively. Our future generations of talent need to be quite attuned to utilizing the tools at their disposal to achieve their targets. As, as those of us know that deal in either professional or personal capacities with youngsters, they are tech savvy. What most of them need, however, is, le is learning how to harness the power of technology. But none of this can be done in isolation. Effectiveness, creativity, and collaboration have become almost synonymous. And what's better than developing talented people with skills is having a team of talented people that can work together effectively. In the Takat of Scholars Enrichment Program, we place a premium on teamwork. This develops further as the scholars, scholars graduate and start working together as professionals across many different organizations. You've touched on it, networking is going to be key for success in the future. The skills the cut of scholars gain are a form of power, and with great power comes great responsibility, Voltaire. The skills they develop need to be harnessed to serve their people, their community, with the highest ethics standards. The ability to understand their community and empathize with, other, with others are a must. But all of these skills will be rendered obsolete if these young, talented scholars cannot develop continuously. That's why it is paramount for us to develop the Takat of Scholars' ability to identify what they know and what they don't know, and to be lifelong learners. It is a must. All of these skills is what will produce Omani and global citizens that will add to their country and to the world, that will grow themselves and also care for their people, their country, and the world they live in. The uniqueness of the Takatov Scholars Program does not stop at what it develops in the individual scholar. This could have been a scholarship program about the selection of a few for international scholarships. However, the desire was to, was to cascade the benefit to as many young Omanis as is possible. Many thousands have applied to the program. Over 3,000 sat for our selection international standardized tests. A few hundreds joined the enrichment program and over 100 have received our international scholarships. All of these are benefits that touched many students all across Oman, truly cascading the benefits of our program. For those 100 or so students that received the scholarships, they spent two years of pre-university preparation in leading boarding schools all over the world, again, having to gain admission into these schools. From Japan, Japan to the East, and you saw some students in Japan, by the way, in the video, to the USA and Canada, and you saw, we saw some of those in the West. They finish high school abroad and are better prepared for the academic rigor they, they will go through in university which prepares them to join leading universities all over the world. Mohammed here is currently studying mechanical engineering at MIT, and he just received two offers from Tesla and Apple to do work experiences. We also have students that are studying in Imperial College. You saw Luai uh, talking about his experience in there. New York University, Purdue, McGill, and the list goes on. These are just a few of the universities that we're, we have students in at this point in time. We have learned a great deal throughout our experience. We have great expectations for these scholars. We have learned a great deal about Omani learners, how to assess for their success and to how to develop them. We would like to continue this journey with you.
Kindly get in touch with us if you need to know more. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amar. The next presentation is by Stephen Atkins, Alliance Manager UK, Nordic and APG at Seba Software UK. Mr. Atkins has a wealth of experience in human capital management, having worked in senior roles in this market for the past 11 years across Europe and the Middle East, including a soft cap and Seba. His knowledge of the rapid changes taking place in the workplace has enabled him to advise companies on how to plan and adapt with greater agility for the future. His presentation is titled, How Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Are Changing the Learning Landscape. Please help me in welcoming him on stage. Thank you very much. Some fascinating insights into what's going on uh, within the scholarship program. I think Venkatesh also touched upon a lot of things that are going on in the world of work. So um, thanks for having me here today. It's been a pleasure to be here. Uh, and spend the next 15 minutes or so um, talking about this very interesting topic, um, artificial intelligence and how learning and development can embrace that. So let's explore this um, and how it's affecting our everyday lives. I think we all agree it's around us everywhere and the changes that we can prepare for within organizations and more importantly within learning and development organizations. It's all around us. I think we all agreed we're seeing this happening uh, time and time again but from entertainment, the things that we can do streaming, through online shopping, retail pieces, through transportation, self-driving cars and things, through security, uh, how we can uh, ward off threats and be proactive, and even healthcare. All these things are being affected by artificial intelligence and things are being embraced currently. But I think there's so much that we don't know either, right? That some uncertainty is really unsettling. I think most of us, maybe, and we're hearing it today, is like, how can that actually affect us in our day-to-day -day jobs? But that's natural to be slightly afraid. But the other side of that, we need to embrace these things. It's natural. So progress is being made at such an incredible speed within organizations. And it's only a matter of time before people working in finance, marketing, human resources, legal, and education, for example, are faced with reality that some aspects of their work might become more automated in future. Is it a threat, or can we embrace that to help our lives make better decisions? That's another thing. However, as uh, Forrester's predictions for 2018 um, notes, over 60% of executives in their organizations are behind regarding their digital transformation. The report also notes that as um, artificial intelligence becomes more ingrained in the corporate world, people with highly specialized skills, such as data scientists, software developers, etc., will want to work for companies that are further along their digital transformation journey, making it more difficult for companies struggling to adapt to these changes to attract and retain their key talent. So, how do we do this? And, and basically, for organizational point of view, before this can make a real impact, organizations need to be culturally ready. So culture is what drives readiness and change, not technology. In fact, the Forrester Report cautions us that nearly, that many artificial related uh, projects in 2018, up to 75% will underwhelm, I'm gonna quote this, underwhelm because they fail to model organizational considerations causing business leaders to reset the scope of AI investments. So in other words, a lot has to be done right in order for new technology to have a lasting positive impact on people and the business. So the importance of cultural readiness cannot be understated. And we heard about it before, willingness to adapt, willingness to change. So what's important for learning uh, development uh, professionals at this point, as uh, Larry Boy explains in Forbes, is to do what they can to assist others to embrace digital transformation by helping people understand, prepare for, and adapt to the direct and indirect impact of automation on their jobs and responsibilities. We're all living in worlds where technology is used to enhance how we do our jobs and to make it easier, faster, and to improve the quality of what we're actually doing. And thirdly, being proactive, we have to be more proactive than ever to help people develop their skills. We're hearing about certain jobs don't exist. How do we scale up for that, that side of things if we don't even know what skills we need to do our jobs? So learn new ones is important and being ready and flexible to change. So something that's the very heart of creating an organizational learning mindset when it comes to digital transformation. 
So the good news is that numbers show that people want to, as even Venkatesh alluded to, and he's done himself, is found that over 74% of respondents in the PwC workforce of the future report are saying that they are ready to learn new skills or retrain to remain employable in the future. So, how do we prepare for those next steps as a learning organization? So, firstly, assessing uh, project skill requirements. Centralized HR systems that hold job descriptions, employee profiles, tracking one-on-one -on -one meetings, goals and performance, these can really make the job of learning and development a lot easier. With that information, you can benchmark that data against current business trends and see and help provide a critical look at what skills are needed in the short, medium, and long term within the organization. There's critical questions to ask such as, how will an employee's core responsibilities change? What technology will they need to know? And what areas of the business can they contribute to with the skills that they have? So having this big picture view when it comes to people in critical roles in terms of the skills and what's needed in the future is really important for learning development to keep resources and learning tools up to date. Secondly, Reevaluate and encouraging open learning. Once you know the skills that you have in the organization and which skills might be needed in the future, you can start to compile essential uh, resources and learning tools that will allow those people to get those skills and to cross-train and to develop. L&D organizations are well on the way to becoming an education and develop enabler a development enabler for people and their teams. We're hearing teams is vital now. We're going away from the individual. Providing quick and easy access and recognition for many different forms of learning. So results from the six annual learning in the workforce survey show that this self-serve type of learning is what suited most employees. And they rank in it differently um, in the ways that the new learning formats are helping them do their jobs. So, Daily work experiences, knowledge sharing with teams, web searches, uh, and the use of web resources at the top of that particular list in the way that people want to learn. So the more traditional ways, classroom training and e-learning, are dropping to the bottom of those lists. And we're seeing other changes. You're probably hearing all things around micro-learning, video-based learning, personalization, recommendations. These are all part of what is making a learning culture change and embracing the, the artificial intelligence around us. And as we'll see in a bit, also gamification and rewards. How do we reward people from learning? That's another way of making people learning paths in organizations more valuable. And thirdly, being able to embrace new forms of technology. So Bursin's 2018 uh, HR technology disruptions report is highlighting the use of virtual reality, augmented reality, and these are being used more and more in corporate learning. So these types of learning experiences, in addition to the formal and informal processes that we have, present learning development professionals with seemingly endless possibilities to help create highly skilled workforces moving forward with the use of this new technology. And even, for example, wearable devices. The application of this new technology can provide employees with a different and perhaps more enjoyable twist on learning. Right? We don't just have to do things, we want to change our mindset to wanting to do things. So think of when you've been uh, using new tools or softwares to help you learn to get something done. It may be daunting at first, but with practice and time, the technology becomes a really valuable asset and can result in faster learning and the retention of knowledge. So, we all live more intimately with technology. I think most of you are using your smartphones even now as we speak. Uh, we can do many different things with them, and it's making our lives easier. So we can order taxis, we can do our shopping, uh, we can find essential items just with a few taps of our phone, right? Apps are helping us do things a lot quicker. But the other side of that is they're also prepared to help us. Did you know that your shopping basket's full or did you know that you're less than 15 minutes away from your next appointment? All these things are helping us make our decisions a little bit easier. So all the time we're using these in our personal world, these types of interactions and uh, connectedness is happening at work as well. 
So while digital transformation is important, we can't forget the fact that culture is underpinning these changes and to help remove in, uh, barriers from our employees so they can find success at all stages of their career. Change without this will be difficult to manage. So, what does this mean? Our companies are learning to adapt to the advancements, diversity and the challenges that it brings to our businesses. Our systems are now so intelligent that they are constantly learning and picking up information to help us work better, work faster, collaborate and share information and files with people more easily and securely than ever before. So learning and development really needs to recognize the impact of, of, of this, these changes and the perceived impact. Technology and AI in particular has and con will continue to uh, have an, an sorry, uh, will continue to have an employee. So these technology and the AI in particular will affect people. In order to help them be top performers, sorry, we need to ensure that organizational culture is ready to establish the policies and practices to support digital transformation and the technology is going to help them get there. So really, I'd like to thank you for listening to me. I just, the left-hand side is maybe how things were working in the past. On the right-hand side, maybe how we're looking to move to the future. Someone being told they have an appointment, the shoelace is undone, they can do these things. So it's a, a real big paradigm shift, I think, in the way that organizations are working. But just let me leave you with this. I think to make all this stuff work properly, we have to have good data, right? Otherwise, you might not be going down the path that you want to. So really assessing your organizations, reevaluating your organizations is a strong way to make sure your successful AI transformations um, move forward. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Atkins, for your presentation. I'd now like to invite Mr. Gunjan Gupta on stage to give a presentation on a very interesting topic. How are organizations engaging their Z generation workforce through game-based learning? Uh, Mr. Gupta is a director and founder of Zobel Solutions. He's also the director of WOM Academy and Violet Infosystems Private Limited. He has 19 years of e-learning experience. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Gupta to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will, yeah. So I, I will run you through the, uh, the gamification concept. I think a lot of people out here already from the HR domain have heard the buzzword. Um, a lot of uh, people nodding heads also. So I believe um, I will run you through the concept. I will try to cover the application of it and I will be trying to make it as relevant as it can be. So uh, what is super fun for you? So do we consider this is super fun for us? Or do we consider this? Or do you think uh, this is the super fun for our for our lives, what we see when we go to, you know, these recreation locations, I think this is super fun. Uh, but I'm sure and the employees, this is, this, this is not super fun for sure. So what, what we are trying to talk about today is that when a manager comes in, this is what I want it to be done by end of the day. So now, when managers come, uh, when a manager comes in sales, uh, you know, this is the task to be done, I need the files to be done. I don't think so. The employee is motivated to say that, okay, this is super fun. I will finish five files today or I'll finish 18 tasks that are hand on hand. And that's the challenge we are facing. So the millennium we are talking about, the, the gene, the, uh, generation, the challenge there is that uh, they want everything to be fun. They are restless. They uh, want to see what's uh, next for them. What if we bring in the super fun? What if we can actually bring in certain level of an excitement on the day-to-day -day job? And uh, while I'm talking about this, um, I'm not just learning or limiting it to learning. I'm talking about the day-to-day -day action that they do. So when we talk about gamification as a concept, gamification is the process of applying or integrating games, uh, game mechanics into your day-to-day -day life. So the tasks that you do, um, the, the actionables that are given to you as assignments, what if there were game mechanics put in a lot around it? Uh, so that could change the way we people, then at least the next generation would look at. What gamification brings, so, so it makes it effective by adding addiction 
to the to the engagement or whatever you're doing. So you're actually now, when you look at gamification, you're not only competing with your peers, you're also competing with yourself. You're seeing what I was doing last, what was my score yesterday. So there is a, a sense of addiction that, okay, I want to go and do it. And um, people who are using apps for health apps, I think they understand when I'm talking about how many steps have I done versus my peer or my uh, the one that I know. So that there is a motivation which you as an organization, otherwise it's very difficult to motivate them to do a task, to complete, to act upon what something supposed to be their job. So we assume the job profile is supposed to be something that they, they should understand, they should behave, they should react on it. But that's, uh, we have to change the way we are looking at it. The level of engagement is also very important. So when we talk about engagement using gamification, we are actually building a kind of a community and we are kind of creating uh, the connect between these um, these people otherwise i may be operating in operations department uh, or of a bank or i'm in a retail side of i may not really be uh, competing with the other department or any person as such i would be very isolated working in my area now when you create an ecosystem like this you are actually creating a huge engagement within the organization so people know who's who and they actually start to engage not only digitally but offline also and the experience so the, uh, the kind of um, tools that are there it can be very experiential um, there could be two utilities which can reinforce the learning aspect also so so i'll try, try to come and detail that out further so what if that was just not the action of just doing na task. So let me run through one example. Um, this is an example um, in Sweden. Uh, they had a, um, uh, sorry, one second. Speed cam lottery as, a, um, as an engagement they created. Sorry, an engagement, it was basically a fine uh, process. Whenever people uh, speeded, typically we find them. And what they experimented is that instead of just fining, so they were fining people who were speeding up, but also they were giving uh, the bonus to people who were actually within the limits. So there were rewards given, there were uh, rewards given to people who were uh, from the same fine amount, and there was a 20% reduction after this policy was introduced. So it cannot be uh, running behind them to get the task done. It should not be that process. I think what we are looking at is the, the next generation is looking at something which is more motivating rather than uh, you know tracking and micro tracking micro management kind of uh, you know uh, possibilities so some of the uh, game elements so the game elements uh, i will talk about like here we have challenges so uh, we are we're talking about a uh, game mechanics uh, that um, will draw attention to this from this audience would be the challenges that we can create the levels that they can cross they can also have progress indicators so you must have seen avatars um, being uh, you know which are indicators of how you're progressing within the uh, within that challenge so there there is a lot of high the person gets uh, you know he getting listed on the leaderboard he gets in uh, a moment of pride that you know yes i have done it it's uh, you know this week i have been able to achieve that target that i've been planning and i think when we look at uh, this uh, you know badges being given i think we do all of that pretty much in, in, a, in a certain environments when we're doing a workshop or a classroom training, sometimes we try to bring in that element to make sure that the engagement is there. And we all accept, I think, the fact that in classrooms we do attempt this. But in the day-to-day -day life, it's completely the opposite. It's very dry, it's very objectively handled. And that's what we're trying to discuss here. Typically, we assume gamification, this is all, uh, you know, kids stuff, you know, it's not for the adults. But, you know, every one out of uh, four gamers is, is age 50, and we are talking about the average gamer age is 35. So now, in that case, are we really, um, are, we, are we just looking at a certain segment and assuming that is the audience? I think we have not experimented, we have not given the opportunity to them to showcase their, in, in their inclination towards this. Gamification, by this, this is a fact that you know improves experience uh, for for 91 percent of the employees. So it's a it's a huge number to look at. It's serious to be addressed. And let me explain the benefits uh, very quickly. 
Um, so enhancing the learning experience. Uh, so if I link it back to the learning aspect of gamification, um, now if you bring in gamification in your learning content, in your um, you, you know training programs, which are digitally or even in the classroom, there is a huge uh, difference in how people look at it. So the enhancement in learning experience is high. You can create simulations. You can create you know um, interactive modules through which people can learn, motivate them increase productivity now uh, there are a lot of tools which are available which actually uh, kind of um, you know, makes the person practice so well that when he goes on to the job he's he's reducing the number of mistakes he does um, you know, some of the projects um, i have seen in the past is that you know you're actually automate you know kind of create like how we had flight simulators in the past so that because there was no scope for errors similarly if you even working with a customer what if you have simulators to practice how to handle difficult situations, how to handle irate customers, and then have the person being placed in front of the customer. Let him not experiment with your customers. So these kind of uh, you know, uh, simulations can actually reduce uh, the errors and improve the productivity. Uh, decision making, again, they are actually doing it themselves in simulations, in games, so they actually experience it. There is lesser um, uh, knowledge, it is more of application of the knowledge that they've practiced. Creates competitive environment because they're competing with their peers, they're competing with all the team members that, uh, you know, like-minded uh, minded people, so it brings in a lot of um, uh, competitive environment for the employees and immediate feedback is very critical that they don't have to wait like in a typical classroom training assessment they have given the training assessment they have to wait for a response and this audience is uh, does not have that patience they want to know if they failed passed, whatever it is there itself and they are very keen to learn so I think when you tell them that you're you're progressing you're not progressing they're completely okay the mind is open so we need to utilize that uh, if you use this uh, tool called Elevate, I would suggest try it out. Um, um, my 12-year-old kid and me both play. We both feel that, you know, it matches the skill level. I don't know how, uh, but it does feel that, you know, I, I don't feel like that it is a kid's um, game because it's challenging. And um, the way it puts you, um, engage you into the entire game uh, really makes you feel that, yes, um, this is the way I want to learn. So if I have to think of tools or, you know, solutions, I would suggest think of solutions for training in this kind of perspective. Don't just, uh, you know, the boring PPTs uh, or uh, first level e-learning modules, which are just conversion of PPTs, do not work. Uh, let's be frank, let's be, you know, I've seen it like uh, last 19 years, I've been looking at what people attempt first. It's like, you know, they start with the level one e-learning and they uh, end up uh, having a huge content library, but that is not consumable. So my my uh, submission here is like I, I uh, like Oman or a bank uh, has implemented a gamification module um, using simulations for the retail banking. So now that is the kind of uh, innovation is being accepted in this region, and I, I strongly believe that you should be also looking at experimenting, seeing how your audience is re reacting, and I believe it will be very different that you imagined. There are training like you know transaction analysis, um, loan against property or mortgage loans. These are some of the you know topics which may look very very difficult, but these are something that's already being done and delivered as gamification. Um, just to give you some insights in terms of though it may look very very uh, you know like I've tried to cover the topics that could be uh, I have seen gamified. It's not the, the complete laundry list. But um, you know, when you talk about induction, uh, there could be brand building exercises. Your brand, uh, your values and vision, vision could be gamified. Even your policy introduction, because a lot of times we hear from the from the HR saying that you know people do not know the policies clearly. They they come to it, they assume that the policy will be the same. So there's a lot of understanding that can be given through such kind of uh, you know gamification process training like form filling to you know sop trainings can be also uh, addressed through games um, so the, the list is long like from compliance to customer facing games uh, so there are companies who are experimenting when the customer walks in into the branch or to their uh, you know the offices they actually having the customer play a game 
you know, from there they actually derive the sales to, uh, sales element of it. So instead of directly pitching the product, it is now being gamification is being used in such unique ways that uh, you know there is an acceptance by the customer you know, before even he knows that the product is being sold to him. So. Uh, compliance is like regulatory, but it's typically compliance is taken as a very boring subject. Again, there are people who are using, um, you know, gamification to engage to specifically for the case studies, for the decision making in compliance. So if you have been in this situation, what would you do? So these are the kind of things that are being done here. So uh, to summarize, there's no game over in gamification. Uh, let's get addicted, addicted to this. Thanks. Yes, we have uh, uh, RAB uh, HR as representatives in, in Oman. Yeah, so we're working with the uh, Bank Musket, um, Oman Arab Bank, as well as um, Bank Dofar in this region, and Petrofac also in, um, in UAE. Development team is here. Already we, no, we, we, development is based in India, um, yeah, but yet yeah, we completely service across the globe. And what is the future of uh, this uh, gamification in uh, different industries? I mean, so, other than banks, which are uh, the areas you are covering? So, um, see, actually, gamification is not very domain specific. So, it's about very uh, subject to the topic that you're taking up. Uh, if you talk about e-learning or you know digital content. Um, but I, I would say that uh, we, from manufacturing to retail to, you know, it's being used, uh, like, you know, if you talk about McDonald's was using video games, um, uh, you know, for training how to make a burger. So it, it's very, very uh, applicable in all domains. I, I don't think so it's restrained anyhow, because it's a concept, it's an application, like how we do classroom trainings in a workshop model and we engage with employees. It's similar to that. When we're digital, why do we have to assume it has to be boring? So what kind of learning process you have? Do you have any learning uh, system for the people, students, or anybody? Yes, so we, we also have like platform where you can host the, and you know, uh, manage the points, badges, and even link it with the rewards and recognition programs. Any kinds of classroom training for this? Yes, in terms of classroom training also, the, there are tools um, that are available. Because uh, we are uh, about to start around uh, digital marketing for 10,000 Omani youth. Okay. So, can we add this uh, program? I will connect with you offline and uh, yeah, I think the audience. Thank you. So, thank I will connect with you. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gupta. It's time to get started with our second panel discussion. And this time, um, we're leading on from, from Mr. Gupta's talk. This discussion is going to be on managing the skill gap and what organizations need to do. And to take forward the proceedings, I'd like to invite back on stage Mr. Venkatesh, the moderator for today's second panel discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know we are nearing lunch, so I'm, we, have, we have been learning a lot on interactive, uh, you know, workshops, interactive communication, etc. So this panel discussion is going to be a little different because we are going to adopt gaming technology in terms of what is going to happen here. So I would request all of you to take your mobile phones, and there's going to be a a, a website address which is going to come, which is called as slido.com. So please log in into slido.com. All of you are going to participate in the panel discussion using this interactive tool. So please go to slido.com and it will ask you for an event number. So put hashtag V415. So while I introduce the panel members, all of you get ready with your mobile phones uh, or your whatever devices you have and get connected to the panel, all right? So while you're doing that, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, kind of draw inferences from the morning sessions and the afternoon session in terms of how there is a big gulf and divide happening between what is required and what people come with. So uh, as I said, what people need are today is skills, uh, very specific skills which uh, organizations need and what technology demands. And, and if you really look at uh, what's happening in Oman, uh, uh, what's, the, what's happening in the region, uh, we, we, we will be wondering, in one side we are hiring a lot of people, you know, we've just completed a massive exercise of 25,000 jobs uh, which has been created in the country. So is the job done? 
uh, are we are we are we done away with uh, are we are, uh, have we finished uh, what we need to do uh, no definitely not no uh, because a lot of these 25000 people have come into organizations and organizations have are starting their jobs now in terms of making them productive making them skill based and and ensuring that they contribute to what organizations want so today's uh, panel discussion is going to be very very interesting we have uh, a, a, a very eminent set of six people from uh, different walks of life uh, uh, representing di different uh, uh, different aspects of learning and uh, I, I have the privilege of uh, uh, kind of inviting them. So the first uh, member on the panel is somebody whom you had just met a little earlier, uh, Mr. A.R. Srinivasan. Srinivasan is the CEO of Falcon Arabia Insurance. He's a graduate in commerce uh, from the Delhi University and a qualified chartered accountant. He's also a chartered insurer from Chartered uh, Insurance Institute London and a fellow of the Insurance Institute of India. He has three decades of experience and Srinivasan also holds an office with the Oman Insurance Association and tirelessly works towards, develop, uh, works towards developing the insurance profession. Please to welcome you, Srinivasan. Thank you. Uh, the next on panel uh, is uh, uh, Mr. Adil al uh, Adil is the head of human resource of Oman Arab Bank. Oman Arab Bank has been doing quite a bit in the learning space, so we thought we should have him to share his experience. Adil earlier had senior positions with the American Embassy, Zubair Group, and the Coast Guards. Adil has 27 years plus experience in the human resource development and holds a master's degree in human resource management and training. Glad to welcome you, Adil, to the panel. The third person in the panel is somebody uh, with a very interesting background, Professor Catherine Binden. Uh, Professor Catherine is the director of the Takative Scholars Program. So we just saw what Takative Scholars Program has done uh, in terms of building skills. So it will be nice to listen to her. In her current role, she works in shaping the careers of several bright young Omanis and coaching and mentoring them throughout their at uh, academic stint. Professor Catherine was earlier the advisor to the president of the University of Bahrain. Back in Canada, Catherine held several senior academic roles, uh, including that of the president of the Okanagan University College. It's my privilege to welcome Dr. Catherine. The next person on the panel is a very, very interesting personality. Uh, he's a Saudi national, uh, Mr. Khalid al Turki. Uh, who is based in Dubai uh, in, in, since 2001 and extensive GCC and wider Middle East experience in senior roles. Khalid is the founder, managing, and founder and the managing director of Marifa Digital, which has been doing a lot of work in terms of creating Arabic content in the e-learning space. There's a, there's a big uh, deficit of Arabic content. So Khalid has been doing a lot of work in creating Arabic content in the e-learning space. Khalid holds an MBA from American University. He holds a, a graduate degree in biology from University of Denver and currently pursuing his DBA. And happy to welcome you, Khalid, on this panel. The next person on stage uh, is uh, uh, another very interesting personality, uh, uh, one of the most senior professionals in the L&D domain uh, in Oman. Dr. Khalid Al Hamadani. <laughs> Dr. Khalid uh, uh, is a uh, doctorate degree holder in human resource management and with 27 years of experience, he heads the Bang Dofa Performance Academy, spearheading the learning and development activities and supporting all HR transformation initiatives of the bank. Earlier, he has worked on several leadership roles with other banks and with Royal Oman Polis. Delighted to welcome you, Dr. Khalid, on this panel. Uh, the, the other panel member uh, we chose was to represent the hospitality industry because that's a big growth area and there's a huge skill gap in terms of work available and people not ready and willing to work. So we thought we would hear on how the hospitality industry is managing the skill gap. We have Nuno Neves. Nuno Neves is the cluster general manager of uh, the Parkin Hotel, a group of Radisson hotels in Oman. And uh, he oversees the day-to-day -day operations. He hails from Portugal, and Neve started his career in aviation and then moved into hospitality industry. 
and uh, he has 23 years of experience in the hospitality industry. Uh, pleased to welcome you, uh, Neves, in this panel. So, so this is our esteemed panel members. So before we get into talking to the panel, I want all of you to vote on the question in the poll. So if you, if you have logged, logged in into Slido, there is a question in the poll. The question is, is there a skill gap in Oman? And if so, how serious is it? So I already have a poll which says it is 75% skill gap is there and is quite serious and some radical measures need to be taken. And it's already moving. Skill gap is there and it's alarming and needs a strong intervention. Skill gap is there but not serious and can be managed. No skill gap at all. So a whopping 65% of people have already said that there is a skill gap uh, happening in Oman among the people who are sitting here. So, uh, so yes, it's serious and let's discuss and see how we take things forward. All right, so while the poll is going on, I would like to uh, ask the panel members here, I would like to start with Professor Catherine on, in your view, uh, how serious is the skill gap issue in Oman uh, in general, uh, Oman in particular? Thank you, Venkatesh, and good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon it is. Um, I, I'm an educator, I'm a teacher, so I have notes because these, uh, these questions are enormous um, and there are so many layers and sub-layers that to keep myself a little focused, um, it's a little awkward, so I apologize. I'll be looking down a whole lot. So, how serious is the skill gap issue in Oman and the GCC? Well, today, it's obvious that there are technical and technological skill gaps that affect how jobs are done, which emerge from a few major causes. First, the lack of practical, experiential preparation of graduates from either the secondary or tertiary systems, together with a lack of sophisticated vocational and technological educational institutions. And the other thing that, uh, that affects this enormously is the implementation of new technologies that change the nature of the workplace. This is something that everyone should get used to because change in the workplace is a constant characteristic of this century, which may well speed up as AI becomes an effective option for many companies. Just as the ATM had a significant impact on the occupational stability of the bank teller, so driverless cars and robotics will have an impact in many sectors. Now, I'm interested, we've, we've seen a lot of numbers about how many jobs are going to be lost to automation. The truth is, uh, there are many numbers, but the, the OECD has just completed a study on the projected impact of automation over the next couple of decades and suggests that more than 200 million jobs in 32 countries could be automated. Um, and that means changed. Um, now, thinking ahead about the practical aspects of what you need your employees to do will become even more critical as the century progresses and Oman's economy diversifies. And the thinking must be agile because there is no timetable change, just a reality. Now, I, I can think of stories from, uh, particularly when I was uh, working in Newfoundland, I was principal of the university on the West Coast, and um, it was an economy that was diversifying, a natural resource economy that was going through the transition from traditional to technology. Um, and I remember once the general manager of Cornerbrook Pulp and Paper saying to me, that he had just hired the last person without a diploma or a degree, whether it was a custodian, whether it was a night worker, whether it was an engineer, whether it was a woodlot manager. And that was because his workplace was becoming so technological that people had to be able to think critically and problem solve. It wasn't that they couldn't do the day-to-day -day job. They had to deal with the unusual events in a very sophisticated workplace. And that's in pulp and paper. 
So there is a skills gap that is very real on the how you do it side of the workplace ledger, which will have to be addressed through ongoing technical upskilling and upgrading practical training programs. This is now a constant cost of doing business. But from my point of view, the most critical and important gap is on the soft, non-cognitive skills side of the balance. The need to go far beyond an individual's practical capabilities and grasp of content is an immediate and pressing challenge if we are to meet the expectations of the future. There are core competency requirements for success in this century that are joined by skill sets that prepare employees for the digital economy or the fourth industrial revolution or whatever catchphrase you want to use to characterize the 21st century. These are attributes and abilities possessed by individuals that prepare them for the 21st century workplace. They cannot be talked from, taught from a text, and there is no one way that these tools can be used, but they can be acquired through engagement, exposure, rehearsal, and reflection. Both failure, failure and innovation are important elements of the process. We are, a learning institute, um, we are a learning institution must be comfortable with and know how to take advantage of both. They are all linked to learning, and while there is no course that teaches this, there are endless contexts that support learning how to learn. Professor Catherine, thank you. We will come back uh, and uh, take uh, more views from you. Uh, so uh, as uh, Professor Catherine said, uh, and I see from the poll that 66% of the people here feel that uh, there is a serious skill gap issue. Uh, we also wanted to see how this is perceived in the region. So Khaled, uh, I would like to, we would like to hear from you sure. on how is the skill gap, uh, how serious is the skill gap in the region? Well, thank you, Venkatesh, for inviting me. Assalamu alaikum for everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and I appreciate the fact that this is looked at also from a, a, a broader perspective, not just from an Omani landscape. Uh, we are, at the end of the day, um, have and share the same values, the same culture. So we want to learn from one another and, and, and apply these solutions if, if there are. By the way, doctor, your answer uh, impacted the results, so it's going up now. More people are <laughs> agreeing with, with the percentage, so that's good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but it, it is a serious gap. Yeah, it is a serious sorry, issue, a skill gap. In Saudi Arabia, where I'm from, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm based in Dubai, so I'm very much connected with the two uh, countries in the UAE and Saudi. Uh, it is a serious issue. Uh, we're about 30, 32 million people live in Saudi Arabia. And 51% uh, 51 51 are below the age of 25, which is a massive, massive challenge that we face. Um, just recently this, this year, um, I think it was the end of January, beginning of Feb, the government announced um, the uh, requirement to Saudisize or have 100% Saudis working in a number of jobs, 12 specifically, mainly in the retail sector. So uh, watchmen, uh, uh, shops that, uh, that sell uh, garment, clothes, uh, so on and so forth. And that was a big shock for a lot of people because we've been talking about Saudization for many years. We've been uh, indirectly pushing organizations to really take that forward and, and embrace it. And of course, people were dodging it, trying to manipulate the system, so on and so forth. But um, they shouldn't be a surprise because this is coming from Vision 2030 in Saudi Arabia where we say we have to really help and empower the locals uh, and that's going to come through uh, integrating them into the workforce. And so companies that I'm working with right now are, are really uh, struggling. Uh, they are running like a headless chicken trying to say where are we going to get Saudis who are going to, uh, first of all, appreciate and want to work in a retail environment. They have some already working, and there's some very good examples, but we have to close that gap in a, in a really period, uh, a short period of time. And that's going to be a challenge uh, from, first of all, the employees themselves not knowing how to sometimes provide basic requirements of customer service. Also, it will have a financial impact on the organization. Also, the whole customer experience is going to be impacted. So it is a serious, serious uh, uh, issue. Uh, we are unfortunately not addressing it um, urgently or seriously. Um, uh, I mean, many, many of, how many of us smokers here? Raise your hand if you smoke cigarettes or... Just admit it, don't, don't be shy. 
Right, so a few of us. So when you go in, and I used this example before, you know, you, have, you, you go and buy your cigarettes and it says a big, big sign in there that says smoking kills, right? But you still go ahead and buy the cigarettes, right? So because you just don't see that problem right there facing you. And I hope you don't have to go through any problems yourselves and maybe this will help you change your <laughs> health habits. But reality is we wait until the last minute to act, right? The signs are there and we're very, very much not reactive and, and we don't take this very seriously. Sorry? Yeah, thank you. About the smoking or? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So thank you, uh, Khaled. Uh, Adil, uh, uh, you have been spearheading a lot of uh, skill gap, uh, you know, bridging work uh, as far as uh, the bank is concerned. So how do you perceive this uh, from an organization's perspective? How do you feel uh, that you, know, you are a 94% uh, nationalized bank, correct? Uh, yeah, so you have 94% of your employees uh, who are nationals. So from that perspective, how do you see this, uh, see this issue? Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Venkatesh, for having me. And uh, thank you so much, everyone actually who attended uh, today, to just really discuss a very uh, critical issue in a very uh, changing environment from a learning perspective. But let me start with something that maybe I'm just trying actually to change the responses rate. I don't believe that there is a skill gap. Would that be enough? There's no skill gap at all, actually. There's something else I'm going to actually to highlight here. Something maybe uh, indirectly touches the uh, issue that we are discussing in terms of uh, skill gap. First of all, of course, we had a discussion, myself and uh, Khaled uh, uh, Turkey, and we were actually debating the same. So I asked him actually to move the debate to the stage. Okay, so we can, we can do that. Bring it on. <laughs> okay, let's, let's first actually talk about what is skill gap in the first place. Let's define it. The traditional definitions of this uh, phenomena or, or issue is, is the, uh, the, the difference between the, the employer's expectations versus the employee's or the candidate's uh, you know, abilities, capacities, and everything else. Now, there are actually two uh, aspects to look at this. First of all, are we talking about the new hires, the fresh grads coming from the schools, or institutions, or are we talking about the existing staff? We have to look at it, at it from a different, actually, diff, two different angles. When it comes to the fresh grads, it's all, we always blame the institutions and educations. But why we call it skill gap? We could just go to the talent pool that we want to have, then there is no skill gap. Why? In the past, there is a job like recruitment officer, for instance very tra traditional interviews and also the admin work. Now, it has become something called talent acquisitions with the technology. So was it there in the work environment before? It was not there. Let's talk about Oman, for instance. Very admin work, recruiter. But was it there in the, in, in the market? It was not there, the technology. Now, we're having so many things. We have, so we have solutions, we have applications, we have things that actually added to the role itself that was not there in the first place. With regards to the existing uh, uh, staff, maybe there is something we can, make, maybe I can change the skill gap to something called self-awareness gap. That's what actually, what we really lack. Because self-awareness uh, is something that to do with the mindset. The mindset of the employees that learning is empowered by them, not, li not like before. It's not like a, a spoon-fed learning culture anymore. So this is actually just to really uh, summarize the, the issue. And then, of course, we can talk in, deta in details about my point of view, and then we can bring it on. Yeah. Thank you. Just, <laughs> Thank a quick, you. just a quick note, uh, the numbers haven't changed, still 25%. <laughs> True. If, if you believe in the numbers, uh, it's that. Maybe there is no network. <laughs> All right, so moving on. So, so 
whether we like it or not, 69% of people have said that there is serious skill gap. So we need to see how we manage it. Uh, yeah. So my next question goes to uh, Dr. Khalid. Uh, uh, so from your industry, uh, once again, the banking industry, can you give us some very specific examples of skill gaps and how it is impacting the, the, you know, your industry's productivities and efficiency? Uh, thank you, Vankatesh. Ven uh, I think looking at, uh, at the theme of this discussion and looking at the responses that we uh, can see coming from the, from the people attending this function, it is obvious that everybody around us almost in, uh, in agreement that skill, skill gap exists. Now, definitely, uh, the time has come for us if we want to tackle the issue, I think this issue has different facets, or this problem has different facets, and there are different stakeholders who need to maybe sit and communicate and discuss. Education system will always be blamed for the skill gaps. Industry will always be blamed for the skill gaps. And also, the ecosystem, the society, the culture, I like the word that has been mentioned before, the mindset. Uh, so the time has come for us, first of all, to reach to a definition on what we mean by skill gap. This is one. The second thing. Now when we talk about uh, example from the industry, the problem with the current reality, as, you, as Vin Dikesh has mentioned in his presentation, with the VOCA environment that we live in, the reality is not helping because now all organizations in different uh, sectors are really in war for talent. So they will always try to take or recruit the cream de la cream. And that's why I think HR has become more sophisticated because more tools are coming. And those tools, guess what? Doing what? All those tools are trying to reject as many number from the influx that is coming from the labor market. So who is to be blamed for this? Do we blame the education in the sector? Do we blame our kids? Or we blame ourselves as employers? I am not here to provide an answer. I think the problem is bigger, is deeper. And the time has come for us to arrange maybe a dedicated forums to take, to look at this problem from a different angle. Now, if I want to take, or I give an uh, example from the, from the industry, I'll talk about my bank. Recently, we have launched a graduate program. The beauty about the initiative that this program has been financed by other sector. So we can see now there is partnership that other, that other sector are working together, that different sectors are working together to find to, to fund a program that, that the outcome of it is to recruit around nine, 90 to 100 Omanis. Now, those 90 to 100 Omanis have gone through a rigorous assessment process. The number, we have started with 800, then 500, then 300, then 200, then we have, we have reached this, this 100. Guess, guess because we have been tried we have been trying to select the best. But again, is this a good case or example for that, that, that uh, demonstrate the severity of the problem? I think yes. Because if you select 90 out of, out of, head, uh, out of 800, based on the competency framework that we are, that we are bragging about, because I'm, I'm, I'm recruiting for competency, does the graduate understand the word competency? I guess no. The answer is no. So, Ventigate, I think, to make this forum useful, I think that let's expand it, maybe in the future, and let's get people, the decision maker around one table, and let's discuss it transparently, because that's the only way we'll make Oman moving toward the talent capital, Oman moving toward talent development nation, which means the kid understand the requirement that the different industries need, 
the educational sector is working to develop those, those requirements, and the employer will always, have the, will always open door to take the best from whatever the supply coming from the different educational institution. Thank you, Doctor. That's a great uh, uh, thought. Now, while uh, we are going to continue discussing this, I'm opening up the next poll. And this is all about you. So, we have, we have been talking very gentle stuff uh, all this time, you know, okay? Now, I'm going to ask all of you a very specific question. And while the next panelist is answering it, uh, put your thinking caps and do this poll. This is question three, not question two. Pavitra, just note, question three. Do you think that in your current job, in your current job, you foresee a skill gap for yourself in terms of what you are expected to perform in the next 10 years. Okay, I repeat the question. Do you think that with your current job, you foresee a skill gap for yourself in terms, uh, in terms of what you're expected to perform in the next 10 years? Polls are open, right? So while you got, you, you, you're polling, uh, you'd like to continue this discussion on my question on you know, uh, uh, specific skill, skill gap in the industry and uh, request uh, Srinivasan to share the insurance perspective. It's very important because the recent directive from the, directive from the CMA has put very strict uh, uh, guidelines on how do you have to have people. So, you are looking at 40% uh, senior management by 2018 and 50% by 2020 and 75% middle management by uh, 2020. So, it's, it's, it's a fairly large uh, gap which you need to bridge. So, what's happening with the insurance industry and what, how are you tackling this? Uh, thank you, Venkatesh, and thank you, Imus, for having me here. Uh, with regard to the first question, my, my personal poll would have been at the number two level. That I do see a serious issue, but it's not a radical thing, but we have talent pool. Uh, I, I will speak mainly for the insurance industry since now it's I don't know, 33 years here and 24 years in the region in insurance. What we see is, is quite a paradox, paradoxical situation in the whole uh, workplace ecosystem. You know, we have people who don't have jobs and we have companies who don't have people with the kind of requirement for the current jobs. Uh, as insurance industry, you know, two, three years back, we were asked to have your management person of 65 percent, which all the companies have now achieved. That is fine. But then you, again, with uh, not a clear definition of what is skill gap, what is there. So we have a lot of people who are there at the customer facing levels, the junior level people. But where we see the gap, so to speak, or where we need the challenges in terms of going forward, and I'm not even talking about the artificial, artificial intelligence generated skill gaps. No, we are talking about skill gaps or the requirements as we are today. We have, we definitely see a challenge in terms of people in the higher management because, and why this has happened partially we probably because we as companies are to blame or partly as we, the industry on a whole. Um, let us be very clear or be frank to admit that insurance is not the preferred industry for most people. Because insurance, you see, it's more challenging, more, it's less paying. You have to work from 8 to 5.30, banks finish at 3.34, government finishes at 2.15, oil industry pays more. I'm being brutally frank, let us admit. And we, as the insurance industry and the various stakeholders related to the industry, have not made the enough awareness for insurance as an attractive industry to work for. By the way, even as we speak, there are various now working towards changing it. And probably as we go later uh, during the uh, hour to see how that is being done. But that is what it is. So the challenge we are currently facing is to have adequate and good people with enough experience and knowledge to take on higher responsibilities and go on to replace people like me in, in the years to come. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a great answer. Uh, uh, so, I want uh, Nuno to uh, reflect on the same perspective. So, like insurance, uh, with so many hotels and hospitality related industries opening up in Oman, 
there are lots of jobs created uh, the, and a major job creation is happening in the hospitality sector. So how, uh, how is the skill gap? Do you have people uh, willing to come and work for every job you have or is it, is it really a struggle? It's the other extreme. You have jobs that you don't have people to come and work in the hospitality industry. So uh, it will be very interesting to hear your perspective. Thank you, Venkatesh, for inviting me here. And it's a pleasure to representing the hospitality industry uh, here in this panel. Uh, let me say like this, that uh, hospitality sector, it's a worldwide industry, and it's known to be one of the worldwide most, uh, where most revenue generating in the future, because as long as there is normal life, people will travel uh, and uh, on holiday and business, or just to celebrate something. And uh, it's uh, hotel sector, it's very peculiar because what are the guests going to the hotel? Either they go to sleep or to eat. They need good comfort, they need a good welcome, and they need to be well treated, and they need to see that everything is well clean. Meaning this is, is the basics of who is visiting a hotel all around the world. And um, talking about Oman, I would say that for sure there is a skill gap and some positions and some other positions not. But I would say that normally it is viewed that uh, uh, hotel sector, hospitality sector, it's like um, line level, it's uh, not well paid. So uh, people are not so keen in going to work in hotels. Um, if you uh, give a choice of jobs to the normal um, people who are graduated, uh, they will for sure, some will choose, but the majority will not choose. So it is uh, the management and the human resources uh, manager, our job, to uh, capitalize the most uh, competent uh, recruitment in order to uh, see who is the best to our hotel. Because there are uh, corporate hotels, city hotels, there are resort hotels, and despite what we have been talking here since this morning, it is true that the hotel business is moving into the high-tech side, but it is obvious that without the human touch, the hotels won't work. So hotels will always need people, human beings, no matter uh, what you say, technology, but they always need people. Meaning that uh, it requires also uh, quite a requirement of self-will, of some, someone who enters the hospitality business. We have two or three cases. We have those that go just to work in hotels because they don't find any other opportunity in other sectors of the industries. There are those that are uh, graduated and so they think they can start to work for the first time in hotel as a assistant manager or manager, which is impossible. And there are those, which is a minority, who have the heart, the passion, integrity, and they have a strategic, they want to go further in hotel business. So they do accept to start in the restaurant, in the reception, or like uh, a graduate strategic plan with the ma management and the HR with the two, three year growth plan moving through different departments and especially also my hotel will represent a worldwide chain Redison Hotel Group like this hotel here where we are at IHG. So each hotel chain, they have their own development uh, plans and the human resources and the the, the person needs to be flexible in order to um, integrate a property, meaning that if he or she wants to grow in the hospitality sector to become a manager one day, needs to stay there a couple of times, but be able to move around the country or to move around the world in order to grow. Because, uh, as I said, at the beginning, um, we receive guests from all over the world. Of course, we receive guests from Oman, but we receive guests from all over the world. And the most, or the best, the most experience you have from different cultures, 
different habits, the best that you can address to the guest when he or she comes to complain about something. And just to finalize this aspect, since uh, I'm here now in two, three weeks, two years I'm here, I'm really enjoying being here working in Oman and I do, um, uh, I do it, take it by heart, this new policy of the so-called Omanization. And together with my human resources, we do have a plan in order to recruit as many Omanis as possible through all the departments in order to cooperate with the national uh, 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 strategy, but also it is uh, my, uh, 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 my belief and my, uh, my taste that wherever I work, I like to work with locals in order to promote, and I could see very glad in the future if I see an Omani uh, manager, general manager in any hotel, I would be so happy. Thank you, uh, thank you, Nuno, that's a, that's a great thought. Uh, uh, please give a warm round of applause for all the panelists, yeah. Now, uh, reflecting on uh, the poll, so a whopping 72% of people sitting here feel that, uh, uh, you know, uh, you are partially competent and will uh, need uh, gradual learning to cope up with job requirements. Uh, so, so, th so there's a lot of positivity and the ability to learn is very much there, which uh, is a, a great sign. Uh, so, uh, so uh, it, it's a very positive, uh, uh, you know, aside from what uh, the, the may, people may I are comment saying. on that? Yeah. I mean, the question you clearly indicated in the next five years. I yeah. think that's also quite far in the future. Many of us cannot really predict how our jobs going to evolve in these next five years. And for us to make a judgment now that not much is going to change could mean two things. One, maybe these jobs are going to be the first jobs where AI is going to take over because we see the no, no change, yeah? The other thing is, I can be completely wrong for sure, but <laughs> yeah. I'll probably go with the first one. Oh, great. Uh, so, uh, the, so, moving on with the discussion, um, this question is to uh, Professor Catherine. Um, you know, in your view, uh, you know, while what exactly do organizations need to do in order to bridge the skill gap? Because we can't just keep saying that government or the educational institutions are responsible for giving us the right people. As organizations, what are three important things which uh, an organization should do specifically to bridge the skill gap? Well, th let me turn that a bit on its head and say, what can you do? Because I'd, I'd like to just leave you with a couple of bullet points that I hope you will reflect upon. And as my colleague, Dr. Amar said, we would love to discuss this with any of you. But first of all, this century moves fast. It moves really fast. Um, and while we in Oman and, and, and the Gulf states are still in transition, we are almost two decades into this century. Um, so the, the, the reality of change and the need to adapt and to find new ways of dealing with our, our talent development, our human capital development, in my view, is urgent. And I think, as I've, as I've said, and as Dr. Amar said, uh, we believe very strongly that um, the, the core competencies, the core skills for this century, really are the soft skills. Uh, universities who are transforming themselves are recognizing that this is something that has to be uh, included in the curriculum, included in the assessment. Um, when we talk about we don't know what the jobs are going to be, we know that we need to prepare people to deal with those changes. Um, I mean, the projection now is that in a, in a career, you're going to go through 8, 10, 12 major, uh, major job changes, not just career shifts, but job changes. So the fact is, start thinking about 2050. Stop thinking about 2020. Start thinking about 2050. When you're doing your, uh, your, your, your staffing plans and things like that, keep in mind, where, is, where are the routine jobs that are going to change? What are the non-routine jobs that you have to uh, be ready to emphasize? Um, it, it won't turn out to be exactly what, you, what you're planning, but as Napoleon said, you know, the plan, planning is everything. The plan may not work, but the planning part of it is critical uh, in, 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 in development. Um, you talk about employer expectations. I think the ability 
to do the job and to change with the job uh, is an employer need now. It's an employee expectation, but it's an employer need. We have moved from the 20th century where employment was a pyramid. You went to school, you got a credential, high school leaving, diploma, a PhD, and at the top of that, parent, that, that credential linked to the job you would do for the rest of your life. It's not that way in this century. It is a continuum of learning. So no longer do we distinguish between education and training. We need both, and we need them in a continuum. We, we go from a degree to a short course to professional development. It just keeps going. And indeed, it is the responsibility of the individual. You heard some of our students acknowledge that. And you know what? They love it. They love being responsible for their learning. It's a great adventure, and they work hard at it, but it's also the responsibility of all of us. So let me throw out a challenge to those of you who are employers. Just as we've done in the Takata Scholars Program, we've created a curriculum, we do a boot camp on soft skills, which is built for Omanis. It's designed, we've developed it for the Omani learning culture. There is an Omani learning culture. Omanis are great 21st century learners. They love to learn by doing. They don't really like reading academic treatises, but they love to learn by doing. They're very good at collaborative problem solving. Once they figure out how to do it, they need to be mentored, it needs to be facilitated, but my gosh, they're good at it. They're competitive. That helps in a collaborative problem solving framework. So, we would love to see some of our corporations. I know you, you, we've got great opportunities in our businesses that are becoming learning institutions that, have, that, are, that are developing fabulous learning programs. But let's take those into 2050 and let's add on this kind of soft skills boot camp. Everybody has spoken today has talked about resilience, communication, problem solving, creativity, you know, there, but there are about 10 or 12 core competencies that everybody has to have if you're going to be successful and productive in this century. So we are here to continue the dialogue. Let's do it. Yeah, Adil, you wanted to add uh, something to this. Oh, doctor, thank you, doctor, for really putting this. You mentioned actually the ability to, to do and the ability to change. In fact, at this particular uh, phase, we need actually to focus on the ability uh, to change and to cope with the changes because the most important uh, things now at uh, this uh, particular phase is to actually to create environment where actually the, uh, the employees uh, be treated as uh, entrepreneurs, as running their careers, as, uh, as if uh, business, not merely job uh, holders. We don't want them actually to deal with them as you know, mere employees anymore, because that won't work. If we really want to focus on, the, on to change, it sh we should not actually look at them as, uh, as staff or employees that we should look at them as actually as entrepreneurs, as career business owners. So if we look at them this way, then any challenges and any change in, in the marketplace, they will be able to do it. And that will actually lead us to bridging that gap because it comes from their side, yeah. not always from the employers. Yeah, great, great uh, thought, Adil. Very great. Just a comment on Mr. Adil. You mentioned bridging the gap, so you are recognizing the gap as we move forward. <laughs> <laughs> the self-awareness gap. <laughs> They're still fighting their, uh, yeah. you know, roundtable battle. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, Khalid. The next question is to you. Uh, uh, how do you leverage technology? You know, you have done a lot of work. Uh, in the technology space, you, you have been an HR professional, moved into using, leveraging technology in terms of delivering training, development, education, etc. How do you see technology as a very critical, crucial element in, in imparting education learning from an organization's perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, as long as we don't see solutions as a one-size-fits-all, then we are starting at the right path, right? We have to be really uh, appreciative of the learners and their differences, the cultural aspects, the language and the complexity of the language. You know, the Arabic language is very rich, extremely rich. 
but also we have to be, uh, we have to recognize the fact that unfortunately our day-to-day -day interaction with one another at work, it's not in classical Arabic. It's in the dialects that we have, whether it's in Saudi, in the UAE, and this needs to be recognized as well when you want to ensure that the learner is, uh, is with you, fully committed, fully engaged. So we've, in Ma'rifa Digital, we've, we've looked into this, and, uh, and, we, and a few, uh, last year we said there's not enough engaging content that is really leveraging technology addressing these elements, the culture and the local dialect. Of course, Arabic language is there, the underlying, but there's a huge number of Saudis, uh, uh, Emiratis, uh, uh, also Omanis, who um, may be comfortable somewhat in conversing in English, but are not uh, um, really able to express themselves fully in English. And this is, there's nothing wrong with that. But often, what organizations do, as, 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 a, as a faux pas, is to put them in a box. These individuals, this group of individuals may not be invited to some of the high potential program or some of the accelerating programs, you know? And we are really uh, ignoring a big population, a big percentage of, of, of people who will really have a big impact. So why not uh, deliver and produce content leveraging technology? And this is what we looked at is, is e-learning uh, provided in local dialects uh, that reflects the culture. It's not something that we take from, from the Western culture and only translate it into classical Arabic. That, that, that's, really not gonna, that's not really gonna help us. Um, yes, we wanna learn from the Western culture, we wanna get the best practice, but also ensure it's a best fit. And, and I completely support uh, Dr. Khalid's uh, point that we need to have those round table to really discuss also how we can leverage technology and bring a number of, 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 of people to that, to that round table. Uh, maybe not invite finance because they're not gonna <laughs> they're gonna keep us on the, on the dot. So, but we'll just uh, no. It has to be a mix. Obviously, it has to be a mix. We have to we have to understand the fact that millennials' learning style is completely different than than our learning style, right? Uh, classroom uh, uh, having uh, uh, self learning. So consider the blended learning. Obviously, in your in your in your uh, solutions moving forward, and finally consider practical. Uh, skills, practical competencies. Yes, I appreciate that we have to have uh, certain certifications and certain knowledge to, to, to begin this journey, but unless and until we introduce practical skills into that curriculum, it's going to be very hard. The soft skills that you mentioned, doctor, absolutely important. That's how it's going to make us move forward and really engage with the requirements of the workforce. So, a, a great point here, uh, which all of us should note, is not knowing a language enough is not lack of competency. This is very true. Many times we stereotype. We say that the guy does not understand, but you are, you are, you are imparting education in a language which uh, is not his uh, first language. So, so, lack of knowledge of language or lack of understanding of language cannot be connected to lack of competency or intelligence. Uh -huh. So, we need to ensure that we provide learning and education in the local language. Just to, to echo with uh, Khalid and Vindication this uh, point, I have visited a corporate university in Turkey and everything is delivered in Turkish language. And they're very proud, by the way, to do it in that way. The good things about it, even the assessment batteries that, that they are using, it's in Turkish. All the development courses are in Turkish, be it functional leadership, soft skills, all in Turkish. And by the way, that I think that was, that was the obstacle for me to send people from the bank to go and study in that academy. Yes. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, true. So, I think it's very important to recognize that fact. Uh, now, uh, I, I wanted uh, this question to be uh, uh, directed to Srinivasan. Uh, what are the possible disruptions you are seeing in your industry which will necessitate employees with different skill sets? Um, well, disruptions in the sense, uh, yes, uh, we, we see the disruption more as obstacles for people to actually come up. Now I'm talking about uh, technology disruptions or things which is getting into the insurance industry. We saw an example of the entire claim process getting automated, etc. Mm -hmm. So when in that kind of a scenario, what are the uh, possible immediate disruptions you are seeing uh, which will necessitate a different skill set uh, from an employee point of view? 
uh, in some respect i would say <laughs> we are a bit fortunate that we are lagging behind in the technology <laughs> here that we don't see that uh, disruption happening immediately but yes um, how do i put it in the sense um, people to come forward to take on new responsibilities we need to bring them up to speed otherwise we would see some uh, because as we move on with the compulsory omanization as the mr al turki said in saudi overnight they made 100% and now we are having to have higher percentage it is inevitable so if they are not empowered and trained adequately we could see some disruptions happening uh, in that in in terms of delivery of service to the ultimate customer yeah thanks dr khalid what about your perspective in the banking industry has gone through a lot of automation and as i was mentioning today almost 85% of banking jobs are done without a human interface uh, so what's going to happen to the employees in the banks you know what how do they survive how do they how do they ensure that they continue to be employed it's very difficult to answer this question because i will lose my customers right <laughs> i think this is really a strategic question because it's not about uh, the banking industry per se i think this is a question need to be addressed on the national level uh, let me guess use some data that you have shared in your slide you said for example 45% uh, of the jobs will disappear in the coming 5 years 33% of the jobs uh has not existed yet so i think we need to be futuristic and we need uh, usually in our strategic plan you know be it an, a banking industry we will always focus on the on showing the commercial side of our achievement and of our challenges i think the time has come to change the mindset and to include in our strategic plan the challenges related to the, to the to the talent development the challenges related to the future the challenges that are related to the talent management and creating a truly ta talent capital in in the industry and in the country so definitely i think we have started this conversation when uh, when uh, and i'll be honest with you we haven't reached an answer yet because the more you dig deeper in answering it you find yourself you haven't reached to nowhere that's why what i'm saying i think we need strategic many strategic plan forms to understand what tool can we use first of all to diagnose the problem of futuristic skills futuristic competencies and then we can come up with the tools to deal with those challenges so i think it's a great point and an observation so while 40% of the jobs are going to be are going to disappear there are 33% of new set of jobs which are going to be created for which there is no skill set so so there is an opportunity for converting that 40 40% into that 33 so it's it's a it's a great uh, thought and that's where i think the entire uh, focus should go forward so I, i know i'm aware of the time so before we take the last few questions i'm going to put one more poll uh, to put the heat on the lnd managers here so i'm going to ask this question is your organization doing enough to give you more learning opportunities let's all introspect is your organization doing enough to give you more learning opportunities the poll is open so uh, while you are uh, answering the polls i would like to have some finishing comments uh, 30 seconds for each okay. of you in terms of how do you want to kind of look at this skill gap as uh, do you do you see it as an issue or as an opportunity to kind of work towards uh, i no, think no. Uh, there's always an opportunity no matter where you are bad or good at the moment but i th i think that we're talking especially in the hospitality sector is like a cultural barrier because sometimes line or low uh, uh, level jobs in hotel are not accepted by society and we as a worldwide company redison hotel group we have a program also for women in lead and leadership and hotel is open 24 hour around the clock and sometimes uh, some people do not accept because they need to work in the night early morning and so on so we face ongoing some culture and we are trying to heal this and to go over by being flexible 
and adjusting the good people that want to work in the hotel according to our needs, formalizing it with all the staff so that everyone can work, and especially on monies, we have a special program for them to grow. This is what we face. Oh, great. Thanks. And Thanks. then the most frustrating thing is that when we train someone and then someone is really good, your first question 20 minutes ago, the hotel next door opens and this person leaves. <laughs> this is the most frustrating thing. Sure. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks. I will, uh, I think I will end uh, this, uh, uh, my uh, input in this panel with a positive thought. And uh, I'll give a case from Bank of Our uh, context. We have start just to address and tackle the skill gap. We have uh, launched an academy, and we have called the academy the Performance Academy. And I think the name gives the connotation that whatever we will do, or whatever we have been doing, and whatever we will do in the future, it will be to help people to improve their performance. And Maybe just to share uh, Dr. Catherine's thought about the soft skill. The operating model of the academy uh, is orbiting around an EQ approach. So everything we do will be linked to the EQ because we have, uh, we have followed some leads from research. And I think that research says as follows. Effective people now, 60 persons attributed to their EQ skills and 40 can be attributed to anything else. For the Performance Academy is a platform that we have created to address the performance gap and to address the skill gap for our employee, be it a new recruit or be, be it existing employee. So j just to clarify, the EQ Dr. meant was emo emotional quotient uh, where uh, your relationship and your networks uh, is very, very important uh, than your knowledge and skills, uh, relatively, okay? Uh, very interesting statistics, 28% uh, people says nothing happens at all. So L&D managers, you know, you need to work on it. 24% uh, people says not always, but sometimes. Yes, sometimes, yes, sufficient learning happens is 17%, and yes, quite a lot is just 9%. So there's a lot to be done in the learning space. Uh, I want to add one point in, in, uh, in relation to the academy. We have also trying, we have also been trying to shy away from the, art, uh, the orthodox conventional uh, uh, learning uh, tools. We are trying now to implement the 70-20-10 model. 70 more functional exposure on job, 20 using the coaching and mentors, mentorship, and 10 classroom-based training. And I... Hopefully, uh, the academy is one of the output of our strategic uh, plan, which will end up by 2020. So hopefully by 2020, this model will be completely evolved. And hopefully the academy will be a case study that we can share with other people from different industries. Yeah. No, I, just, I think that that's uh, definitely something interesting is to um, spread out the learning out for sure. The percentages, we can always debate on how much to put in where, but at the end of the day, we really need to embrace technology. I mean, this the only message that I want to leave the audience with is really embrace technology and recognize that the millennials who are your biggest population are going to want to have that technology for them to learn, for them to develop. And the challenge that we have today, and we need to recognize that, is that many of us are not familiar with the technology, especially when it's the space of learning and development, and we are not so sure about the return investment. And based on these assumptions, we're making decisions that are going to have a huge impact later down, down the line if we, don't, if we don't address it. So I, I really encourage everybody to reflect back on, 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 the, on technology uh, and introduce technology, e-learning in particular, and have a blended a kind of a, an approach when it comes to, to developing the, 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 the workforce. Thank you. Professor Catherine. Um, it, very quickly, and trying not to repeat all of the good things that have been said so far. Um, don't confuse a credential or a degree with an individual's preparation for your workplace. Drill down. In this century, knowledge is nothing without the ability to apply it. So um, don't, don't look at the credential as, as the real reflection, the real measurement of your future employees or, or, or current employees. 
adil uh, yeah. your your final thoughts yeah so no matter how fancy solutions that we have no matter how fancy uh, applications or technology that we have the most important thing is actually the the culture we need actually to make our our employees uh, uh, be part of the uh, of the whole learning uh, uh, process because uh, they are actually needed uh, to look at them as a change agent uh, yesterday i was actually at the panel uh, discussions of uh, our lead uh, program lead is uh, our barnabaj uh, qiyada is actually targeting uh, it's more of like hypos or high potentials uh, program we are actually having 20 uh, uh, from oeb staff who uh, selected from different disciplines of course we have selected them for uh, just to make uh, make it short certain competencies were actually uh, uh, identified the doctor katherine mentioned some of them but the most important thing that what happened yesterday at the uh, panel discussion is that we make the project we may we ask them actually to come up with the project and the themes five themes this is the lead actually is the six month four module program part of it is to work on project we did not select the projects they themselves selected the projects so they became part of the learning process the, the the innovations will be there the creativity will be there the belonging will be there because they are part of it from the beginning and not only that we have of course the technology investing in technology we use the the, the part of the employee engagement as a tool to further to further invest in the technology the outcome of the technology for instance when we launch um oeb learning the academy with our colleagues from uh, uh, zobel we're making a free marketing for them and also uh, uh, saba halogen performance management system actually we even use it for uh, learning uh, uh, purpose but even though when we actually have all of these uh, technologies we branded them we branded them the br performance management for instance we called it masar the oeb learning we called we called it the uh, uh, nebras for instance they were part of it from the beginning so the brand was made by them the also the projects is also made by them it's not about having the solutions and applications and technologies but it's all about having actually all the employees empowered engaged aspired and looked at them as part of the whole business process not as employees but as business partners yeah thank you adil uh, so you're uh, yeah, finishing remarks i will yes. probably take a little over 30 seconds uh, uh, everything is not as negative as i probably made it out to be uh, one problem which uh, kethi mentioned and uh, mr alturgi mentioned is the language i used to also teach some of the students for the insurance learning and the uh, major problem is to uh, cope with the english which is required for the chartered engineering to london but when i go through a colleague of mine who is able to explain to them they fully understand absolutely now as an industry uh, late start better uh, but better late than never uh, we as an industry have now started to uh, put in place different ways to handle it uh, soft skills probably each of the companies handling on its own on the basis of the individual requirements uh, major uh, credentials as in degrees or diplomas related to insurance the whole industry along with the regulator is working on different various uh, means either charter insurance to london or the one in uh, bahrain in terms of empowering the employees to do or get more uh, practical skills practical training we as an insurance association have started some lessons where industry experts including omani seniors who have been fortunate enough to get different credentials to actually teach them the practical aspects this has started happening in the premises of the association where we have a classroom which can accommodate 25 30 people this is started happening so we are slowly getting the people empowered and practically trained on various skills what you know said we as an insurance industry face very much like a banking offer comes somebody goes away so do we and some other senior colleagues sometimes ask when this is happening like people are actually we train them and then they jump and go away so do we actually need to spend so much my answer to that is 
what if you don't train and they end up staying with us? It's going to be a bigger problem for us. Uh, the other thing is one very short point before we take questions is that uh, Steve mentioned in his presentation that unless and until you also tie rewards and recognitions also into your learning uh, things, you would, you would face this. So you also have to retain people and that's the challenge of an organization. You give them education but you also retain them. So, so why should they continue with you? Yeah. So that's, that's, a, that, that's a very important thing. Yeah. So we have uh, very little time. I, we don't want to be between you and the lunch. So we will take two questions. Uh, so uh, uh, you, you have already spoken. So you'll get a turn later. So we will look at somebody else. Uh, 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 there's a hand going up behind. So uh, oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So pe oh, my God, people have already used uh, the technology. So there are three questions. So we will. Uh, take uh, how can we accelerate the use of gamification tools in learning fine i think that was answered please take it offline uh, with uh, gunjan and the others uh, do you think implementing 100% localization will impact diversity in workplace uh, anybody wants to take uh, a question on on that uh, uh, this the, the second question is do you think implementing 100% localization will impact diversity in workplace talat yeah I, I don't want to look at the question from the diversity uh, perspective. I think it will impact definitely the quality. It will, it will impact the... One thing we need to keep in mind when we look at a proposition like this, it's not about the localization only. It's about localization and also the, the impact on the output of that organization. And by the way, I think the private sector, different industries, now they are trying to compete in a different league. Not on the national level, not maybe in the regional level, but they are trying to compete on the international level. So when you want to be a global organization or an international organization, at least from a standard perspective, the, the manpower needs to be recruited based on merit, based on competencies, but definitely the local talent can be given priority. So I don't want to look at it from a diversity perspective because this proposition is very, is very critical. We need to look at it from a different perspective. The protection, the standard, the quality, and also will those, uh, will those outcome be impacted by 100% localization? Man, I'm just, uh, Returning the question, it's not an answer. Okay, we'll take one more question. How do you identify future skills required in the workplace? Uh, anybody uh, in the panel want to uh, take that question? How do you identify future skills? Uh, well, let me just uh, start a bit. There's an enormous amount of research and all of the speakers today have talked about the attributes, skills, abilities, competencies. Key, you need to know how to learn. There's no magic bullet in any of this. E-learning doesn't come easily. You have to learn how to learn from e-learning. So you need mentoring, you need facilitation, you need all of those things. Uh, the other part that's, uh, that's very important is you, we can't just buy other nations' learning products and think they're going to lead to success here. We need to develop our own curriculum. They need to be holistic. Um, and it needs to be, as I said previously, very much rooted in the success of Omani learners. Our Omani learners will take a lot out to the world just as they bring a lot back. But we need to be building our own learning products. And I'm thrilled to hear that we are. Thank you very much. Uh, there's also feedback. This is the advantage of, uh, you know, uh, having open communication. You ran out of time. So somebody has said that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Uh, the panelists, I think it was a, a great session. I'm sorry we don't have time for uh, kind of personal interaction. We are using the tool. We have answered questions uh, through uh, questions asked by most of you. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope the session was enjoyable, informative. And we, uh, in, uh, on behalf of the panel, uh, uh, enjoyed it as much as uh, you m uh, have enjoyed listening to it. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank you, Pavitra, for uh, being behind uh, the polls and the uh, Slido. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, all right. So just before we go, uh, first of all, a big round of applause to all our panelists, please.
I'd also like to remind our guests that post-lunch we have a workshop on the use of psychometrics in learning and development, which is conducted by Naveen Martis, Client Director, Corn Ferry Hay Group. Uh, that's going to be in the Le Card room, which is uh, down that way. Uh, in case you need directions, just ask any of the UMS staff. They'll be able to help you out. Uh, we would welcome you to join the workshop as well, of course. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors and our partners, Bank of Beirut, Oman Arab Bank, the strategic partners of OER's finance and HR Summit, BMW Oman, our automobile partners, Takat of Oman, the HR knowledge partner, United Securities and Tajir Finance, our support partners, Takaf Al Oman Insurance, the Islamic insurance partner, Arabia Falcon Insurance, our insurance partners, knowledge partners, RAB and Zobel Solutions, Times of Oman and Shabib, our media partners, Oman Printers and Stationers, our print partners, and Yella, we offer our digital advertising partners. And once again, a big thank you to all of you for attending today's event. Lunch is now served, and we look forward to welcoming you at OER's Finance and HR Summit in 2019. Thank you very much.